Communications Committee. I'm here with Mr. Dean Case. Just wanted to start off by saying thank you guys for joining uh, the kickoff webinar for this year. Um, we're going to go into a, some upcoming events um, and then we'll introduce our speakers today. Okay, after we tonight is the kickoff for the section year, and we're going to have two great speakers and talk uh, motorsports. This coming weekend, for anyone who's around Orange County, we would encourage you to attend Electrify Expo, which is the inaugural event at the OC Great Park in Irvine. It will be all forms of electric mobility, cars, scooters, uh, e-bikes, everything. Uh, and they were, the organizers of the show are gracious enough to offer some free display space for uh, UC Irvine's Formula SA electric team. So go by and visit the Anteater racing team. And if you are an SAE member, check your email that you got from Mike Guidry yesterday. There's a discount code for tickets for Electrify Expo. So uh, support this great new event in our backyard. Following that, we got the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach. And that really ties into our two speakers because uh, the, the original Long Beach Grand Prix 1975 was for Formula 5000, followed by a stint of Formula 1 before the switch over to IndyCar. So there's a great tie in there. And the folks at the Grand Prix of the Long Beach Association have been gracious enough about the last eight years now, I think, wow. we have student displays there. So go into the expo area and visit our teams. I think we're going to have Cal State uh, LA, Cal State Northridge, uh, Cal Baptist. I'm not sure who else. The uh, Dr. Chris Bachman from Cal State LA and, and the Student Activities Committee, Committee are organizing that. So stop by and say hello to the students. Also, if you're an alum of any of those schools, there'll be discount codes available for you to buy tickets. And then we're going to kick off, it's hard to believe, our 33rd annual student workshop. Wow. This year it's going to be at Cal Baptist. In addition to we want students to attend, we would like to encourage companies who are looking to hire to attend. We did a little showcase a couple of weeks ago at the NHRA uh, Museum in Pomona, and Gail Banks called up and said, can we come out? And said, you never say no to Gail Banks. And Gail showed up and brought five engineers who was there to recruit. And that's what we really like to do with SA SoCal is to provide opportunities for brilliant young minds on Formula SA and Baja teams uh, exposure in front of people who have the ability to say yes to hiring them. And it's a great, you know, you don't have the time or budget to go visit a dozen plus schools, but if we can bring the best students to one location, it's a great opportunity. So please uh, mark Saturday, October 9th to come out to Cal Baptist. And we are joking that we'll let any company hiring speak <coughs> for free. If you want to speak after that, we're going to charge you, I think, $100 a minute. So, so if you talk for 10 minutes, we're going to charge you 800 bucks. Uh, but it's worth it to get in front of these students. And then we've got Mr. Delbert Boone and the Meetings and Tours Committee. Uh, has got a couple of great ones we're working on the details. In October, we're going to talk about wind tunnel testing and then automotive design, um, November 9th. And then we're talking to the folks at Comotion LA, which is talking in bigger picture terms about the history or the future of uh, transportation and mobility within the greater LA area. So that should be an interesting event we're working on, hopefully an SA discount on that. So yeah, look forward to those events. That's, that's going to be a great experience. Um, if you guys need any more information, you can follow these links up on the screen, um, saesocal.org, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, to uh, get some information about the events above or even more additional information. And last thing, I just got to thank everyone here at Mechanica. This was a last minute setup here. This is brilliant. And it shows you what John Steiner, Henry Smoker, and all the guys at Mechanica do. They do a lot of teaching. I was actually in Ventura today for a meeting that ran late and I realized I wasn't going to get home in time and mechanic is an Oxnard. So I called up John and said, can we use your studio? <laughs> and he said, sure. So uh, that's how this came about. So if we can pull up, uh, we can shut, stop the screen share and pull up our speakers. I'd like to introduce uh, two fantastic journalists, two great friends. And we're going to talk about uh, IndyCar racing and other forms of open wheel racing. So uh, some of you got, Henry, you're not old enough probably to remember Formula 5000. No. I think it died out before you were born, but uh, John Zimmerman wrote the definitive book on this really beloved series. Yeah. And John's written several books. And to show you the esteem that John Zimmerman's held in, uh, he wrote the book on Dan Gurney's Eagles, which means that Dan Gurney himself trusted John to tell that story. And I think that's quite the feather in the cap that if you're trusted to tell that story, uh, you're both a great writer, historian, but also a trusted friend. Uh, John Oriovis, I've known for a number of years in the motorsports press area. 
And he's kind of, is it fair to say, John, you're a younger version of uh, Robin Miller? You started out as a fan, uh, but you call it like you see it, and you're not afraid of annoying people at times, which is, I think those of us who are fans appreciate that. That's one of the nicest compliments you could make for me. And um, in memory of Robin, I'm uh, sporting my iced tea and a mug and bun cup tonight. Yeah, so. That's fantastic. Because, uh, you know, <laughs> and Robin. And for anyone who doesn't know who Robin Miller is, it means you don't follow the sport closely enough. But um, and so we've got John Zimmerman uh, calling in from his home in Long Beach. Uh, John Orievitz is calling in, as you can see from the poster, from the dark side of the moon. And uh, we got, we're going to have this very informal, but we're going to have, uh, we'll start with Mr. Zimmerman because his book starts earlier in history a little bit with some of the photos. And they're going to eat, each show a few highlights of uh, some of the cars. A lot of what they talk about is not just the technology, but the politics that shapes the rules uh, of our sport. And then uh, Mr. Oriovitz will talk about his book and then we'll get into some Q&A. And we really welcome questions. So uh, go to the Q&A section, and uh, we'll answer as many of them as we can. So without any further ado, uh, Jay-Z, you want to talk about Lost in Time? Well, Let's I'm, see if the screen share works. Am I, what am I doing here? Screen share. Click. No. Oh, no. We got your screen. We just need to open That's up desktop. your desktop. Click on the PowerPoint. Yeah, it should come up. Okay, there we're. There we go. Let's go back. You had it. Well, it doesn't want to stay. Sorry, I'm not an engineer, although I did study it way back. Okay. Anyhow, I've got. Uh, um, this book is was a labor of love, as it were. I love this series, and it's been underreported. And uh, it, it was a great, you know, it, it, made, it answered so many questions correctly, and then it just disappeared because of lack of interest from the SCCA. Uh, and I'm not the only one who says this. Most of the people I talk to in the book talk about it as well. And uh, this, the cover photo, which hopefully you're seeing now, is... Uh, not, see the cover of the book. Not only is Formula 5000 lost in time, but Riverside is lost in time. And Dean tells me he's in the crowd somewhere there. Yeah, and that's coming up towards turn six through the S's. Yep. And I was somewhere, I think, around turn three. I would have been about 12 years old at the time. Yep. But John, actually, can you go on uh, PowerPoint, uh, the slideshow, and start it? They'll make the slides a little bit bigger. Yes, we're trying. We've got a technical assistant. Hello, Carol. Hi, John. <laughs> there we go. All right, there we go. All right. This book just came out a few months ago. So if people are thinking, I haven't seen that, that's right. So you have to run up. For those in SoCal, drive up to Auto Books in Burbank. Yeah, I'll be doing it. And, and my, my approach was to discuss, I discussed the, the formation of it how the, the club came to put it together and what the classes were before that Formula A. Formula A was put at the top of Formula B and Formula C. And they originally had three liter full race engines. And in the second year, they decided to go to pushrod engines. So then I start talking about the tracks and then go through each track and do a thumbnail uh, description of it, list the records. And so you can compare Formula 5000's record to Formula One and, and IndyCars and Can-Am if they all ran there at the same time. These two tracks are uh, Riverside and Laguna Sake, obviously, for anyone who's paid attention. And I go through um, all the tracks that had more than one race, plus Long Beach, which only had one race, but theoretically was the best 5,000 race ever. Okay, next. Okay, then I, after I talk about the tracks, I talk about the cars. And for all the marks that won, I do a, another... A little history of the company and how they came to build this car and set of specifications off to the right and a photo. This is David Hobbs in the Surtees. And that's also from the high wing era, as you can see, which was a brief period of time in uh, 5,000 history. And then we do this all for Lola and Eagle and 
there's a long list of manufacturers that uh, took place took part in the series, and one of them, Chaparral. We have a we have a uh, sidebar here where Jim Hall and Franz Weiss both talk about this car, which was a rebuilt Indy car that GM uh, built for Smokey Unique to run, and it never made it. And so it was sitting in Hall's shop, and after Jim had crashed and hurt himself at Las Vegas, Franz and Troy Rogers called him up and said, yo, can we build this car for 5000 And Jim says, well, we're not doing anything. Why not? So they did. Franz took it to uh, Brainerd, where it had an engine problem, and then he went to Lime Rock, and he got collected in an accident just after the start. And that's the end of it. The whole story is in the pages, as you see there. So... Uh, Franz, Franz says, my driving career ended right there when I woke up in the ambulance with my wife. So I don't, I don't know what became of the car. It's probably in a shed somewhere in Midland, Texas. And then we talk about the drivers, the players, the teams. And then I, I give them my, quote, humble, unquote, opinion on who the top 10 are. Here's three and two, David Hobbs and Mario Andretti. And... Uh, that way you pay it, you know, we talk about the cars and tracks and the drivers. And then we get into the seasons. And each season has a small uh, synopsis and a list of the winning cars and drivers and appropriate photography to go through. And oh, let's go back one. That's not working. Anyway, that, there it goes. Uh, that's Brian Redman after winning the, Indi the first Long Beach Grand Prix, also in September, as Dean said. And the lady holding the uh, trophy there is a lady named Patty Queen. She was the wife of one of Pook's, uh, Chris Pook is off to the right in that photograph. She was the wife of one of Pook's uh, financial partners. And the intended race queen was indisposed at the time that the race ended and couldn't be found. She ended up... Uh, Somewhere James Hunt wasn't in the race, was he? Oh, sorry. He's yeah. a bit off color. Who's in the picture? No, James Hunt, I said. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, James Hunt. Joke. No, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they drafted Patty to uh, be the race queen. And so Brian's got a big chuckle out of that. And he had a big chuckle about winning the race and the championship that day. And then uh, after 5,000 met its demise in 19, uh, the end of 1976, it's taken a while, but there's a, 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 a vibrant historic racing scene. And his car, this Lola T332, that's uh, Rick Parsons at Elkhart Lake several years ago. Hmm. Um, he's won three. The far, historic Formula 5000 is built into two classes, the old cars and the new cars, as it were. And he's won the new class three or four times. In, in the, uh, it's been a ha happening since 2008. And uh, there, there is a vibrant, the, the, the historic scene is, is probably even more popular than it was in the day, as witnessed by this con con conglomeration of 5,000 cars at Laguna yeah. Seca in 20,000, 2018, celebrating the 50th anniversary. And you see Shadows and Lolas and Maddiches and looks like an Elf in there and a Chevron, all sorts of various cars. And that's... Uh, Today's, you know, it's it's a kind of a vindication of the series that it's so popular today that these cars are so pure in what they provide and everybody's latching on to it. And then uh, the, the, we saw the cover, which is really the dust cover, and this is the undercover of the book that uh, has features Redmond and uh, is equally stunning as the other cover. And that's all I have for a presentation. It looks like we got one question uh, we'll throw to you right now uh, from my friend John Tholley. I heard in his younger years, Herb Fischel once designed an IndyCar. Any relation to the Chaparral and the sidebar? I'm uncertain that that's the case. It could well be. Okay. It was. Uh, I, I refer to it in the book as coming out of General Motors' legendary back door. So Herb may have done that. Yes. I, I do not know. I'm sorry. Well, Herb's still alive. Someone should ask him. Right. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Rovitz, you want to uh, run through your slide deck and then we'll get to the fun Q&A. Yep, let's see if I can um, 
negotiate the well, sharing here. here. I'm viewing John Zimmerman's screen. Come on. John Orbitz has started screen sharing. We're getting there. Yes, you should be seeing the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah. Confirm that? Okay. Looks like a golf course there, John. <laughs> well, there is a fine golf course designed by Pete Dye, in fact. So, first of all, thanks, Dean. Uh, thanks, Henry. Thanks, TJ. Thanks, Norm. Thanks, SAE SoCal uh, for the forum and the opportunity to be here and, and, uh, and join you guys on a Wednesday night here in Indianapolis. So, uh, I am indeed Oreo. I am John Oreovitz, and my latest book is indeed Indie Split. And while the focal point is the division between CART and the Indie Racing League that lasted from 1996 to 2008, to tell the story, you really have to go back to 1945 when Tony Holman purchased the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And I can tell you it looked a lot different than if anything, just <laughs> because everything was black and white in 1945. Um, but Tony Holman had no way of knowing that uh, that he was starting a 75 year odyssey of his family over three generations as the stewards of the speedway and ultimately as the sport of IndyCar racing. Um, you know, the, the speedway, it's arguably the most famous racetrack in the world. And it was under Holman's leadership that in the 50s and the 60s that that its popularity exploded. It's routinely called the largest single day sporting event in the world. And it continued to maintain its strength into the 70s. Uh, but the while the Indy 500 stayed strong, the rest of the sport, the races at other tracks, uh, really fell into decline. Um, in the late 70s, shortly after Mr. Holman died, there were a group of team owners that raced in the USAC series. Uh, there was a group that was instigated by Dan Gurney and, and put into action by Pat Patrick and Roger Penske, and it was called Championship Auto Racing Teams. It was CART. And it was modeled after what a guy called Bernie Ecclestone did in Formula One, where he organized the team owners to try to take over the commercial rights of the sport. Um, ultimately, that battle between the team owners and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway management, um, you know, it, it lasted, honestly, 40 or 50 years, and it, it wasn't really resolved until the last decade or so, so... Uh, because we're with the SAE tonight, I'm, I'm going to focus mostly on cars and the technology of... of the Holman era. Uh, 10 years ago, the Speedway Museum brought out 33 winning cars and they staged them on the main straight. And it was, it was really a neat opportunity to see how things had changed over a hundred years. You've got to remember the first Indy 500 was in 1911. So that's they're, they're 110 years into their history now. So it was a neat day to be at the Speedway. And, um, you know, and this is for many people, this is this was the glory days of the Indy 500. This is A.J. Foyt in 1961 in a, in a Watson Roadster, or I should say a copy of a Watson Roadster. Um, and that's what Indy was about in those days, these brutish front engine cars and, and burly tough guys that drove them. Um, but that was the Indy 500 only, and the rest of the series was this. Uh, this is, again, A.J. in the 60s. Most of the, most of the other races up through the mid-60s were on dirt tracks. Uh, it wasn't until the latter part of the 60s that there were more paved ovals, road courses, et cetera. But what really changed it all was this car. This is the 1965 Lotus Ford that Jim Clark drove to win the Indy 500 that year. And it was the first win for a rear engine car. And it was important, not just technically, but philosophically. It, it, it just heralded an entire changing of the guard um, and it had started in Formula One five or six years earlier. And it, uh, as, as usual, everything takes a little time to get to IndyCar racing. But, but Lotus won on their third attempt. And uh, by 1967, every car in the field had a rear engine. So a neat thing about the Indy 500 is it was kind of a showcase for technology, especially in the 60s. Uh, this is Parnelli Jones in a, in a car that was powered by a turbine engine, a Pratt & Whitney that you'd normally find in a helicopter. Into the 70s, Parnelli became a team owner, and uh, this is his car from 1972, and you can see it's got some pretty radical aerodynamics, and it had some interesting suspension concepts as well, and none of it worked. Um, by the late 70s, the blueprint was set. This is the Chaparral 2K. This was designed by John Barnard. 
later of McLaren and Ferrari and Benetton Formula One fame. Um, this is the basic blueprint for everything to come, which is a, a slim central tub with side mounted radiators, single fuel tank behind the driver, uh, turbocharged V8 engine, 2.65 liter turbo is the engine formula from 1970 up till the t- mid 2000s. Uh, every, every car out there today is, is still basically this. Um, you know, by the by the 90s, it looked like this. This is Rick Mears and a 92 Penske. And I think that's about as beautiful as it gets. Um, <clears throat> engines and other components were getting more refined. So the cars were kind of shrunk wrapped around them. <clears throat> and then in 19, uh, in 1990, the Holman family, the third generation, this is Tony George, uh, the grandson of Tony Holman. He came into power. And he was in disagreement with the cart team owners, and he decided that uh, he wanted to emphasize oval racing and cheaper cars and American drivers. And he decided that the way to do it was to take the Indy 500 and to build his own racing series around it. He called it the Indy Racing League. These are the Indy cars that he brought out. This is a first generation Delara. Uh, They were big, clunky, loud. I'm, you know, I'm sorry for editorializing here, but. If, if you appreciated the path that IndyCar technology had taken from the 60s through the, through the mid-90s, these cars were frankly insulting. Um, they were dumbed down. They were low technology. They were built to a price, and it showed. Um, you know, by contrast, the cart cars of the era, this is a 2002 Lola from the last year, that there was chassis competition in cart, and you can see how everything's just really tightly shrink-wrapped. Uh, and the driver is much better protected. You can see as well in the cockpit. This is a third generation IRL car. Uh, one of the things I failed to mention about the first generation is, is that they had a really significant safety problem. They injured a lot of drivers in 1997 and 98. Um, this car had a problem in that it, it took flight. Um, there was a lot of pack racing in the IRL. The cars would run wheel to wheel like like uh, restrictor plate cars at Daytona and Talladega and NASCAR. And it's just kind of a bad recipe for IndyCar racing. Uh, They really dodged a lot of bullets until the very last race that this car ran at Las Vegas in 2011, when Dan Weldon got up in the fence and was killed. A sad day. This is an interesting sidelight in the whole IndyCar thing. This is the Panos DP01. This is what the latter day version of, of cart called champ car ran for a single season in 2007. And because the, the cart IRL war finally ended late that year and into 2008, um, this car got put into mothballs and the IRL car that we just saw, uh, this thing, the, the 2003 Delara, this ended up being the IndyCar spec car from 2003 to 2011. Uh, the DPO one interesting to see if it would have made it cause it was, a, it was a neat little car. This is what replaced it in 2012. This is known as the Delara DW12. Um, kind of an ugly duckling of a race car. The formula, the engine formula changed. Uh, the IRL normally aspirated V8 changed to a 2.2 liter V6 turbo uh, provided by Honda Performance Development and Ilmore badged as Chevrolet. The idea from the beginning with this car was that the engine manufacturers and theoretically they hoped for other aerospace and automotive manufacturers would create their own bodywork for it. And that finally happened in 2015. This is the Chevrolet aero kit car with, you can see it's got a lot of gingerbread on it. It didn't really improve the racing. Uh, It was kind of a costly and ineffective dead end. And what we got back to in 2018 was the same central chassis, um, but with a single body kit that they purposely designed to look a lot like the cars of the 90s. Uh, You'll notice that the air box is gone. It does have a comically large roll hoop. Um, This picture is from 2018. Uh, Since then, the car has grown something called the aero screen, which is a variation of the halo used in Formula One with a plexiglass windscreen wrapped around it. And then quickly looking at the engines, for decades, the Offenhauser four-cylinder engine is what ruled the roost, um, honestly, from the 40s into the 70s. Um, In the 70s, it started to show its weakness. Um, Unlimited turbocharger boost, they just blew them up at a a comical rate, which the IRL managed to do later in the the late 90s with, with their first normally aspirated engines. 
But what changed the game from an engine perspective in IndyCar racing was the Cosworth. Uh, the Parnelli team, Parnelli Jones again, uh, ran a Formula One team that ran Mario Andretti in the mid-70s, in addition to a Formula 5000 team. Um, Parnelli's team was quite versatile in those days. Anyway, the, the Parnelli F1 program kind of petered out, but they experimented by taking one of their, their F1 chassis and they took a Cosworth DFV Formula One engine. They destroked it down to 2.65 liters to meet the IndyCar regulations and they turbocharged it. And it was very successful. Al Unser won a race very quickly in it. Uh, a lot of teams started picking it up in 77 and 78 and it, it finally put the Offenhauser out of business. And in fact, um, Cosworth, it was so successful that Cosworth just kind of stole some of Parnelli's people in the design and started building the engine for themselves and called it the DFX. And history kind of repeated itself because in the 80s, some Cosworth guys, Mario Illion and Paul Morgan, left Cosworth, formed a company called Ilmore, went into partnership with Roger Penske, built a better Cosworth engine. And that brings us to the final slide here, which is arguably the last engine innovation at the Indy 500. And the ironic thing about it is, is that it was an old fashioned design. Uh, what was perceived as a loophole in the Indy 500 rules allowed an overhead valve pushrod actuated engine to run additional turbocharger boost. And it was designed to, to let, uh, first of all, to give the Buick engine, the Buick V6 that ran there an advantage. And then later to give guys like John Menard, who went to the expense of building an aluminum block to try to make a better Buick. Nobody at USAC or the Speedway or anybody counted on somebody, i.e. I. Roger Penske and Ilmore, having the wherewithal to create a clean sheet overhead valve racing engine in 1994. And of course, this thing went out there. Uh, it's documented in Jade Gers's book, Beast. Uh, 1,024 horsepower at a time when the best Cosworths were doing 825 to 850. Uh, needless to say, Penske crushed the opposition in the 94 Indy 500. And that was one of the bricks in the wall that, that led to the, the 96 split, of course, that lasted 12 years and crippled the sport and made NASCAR uh, synonymous for motorsport in America. So on that cheerful note, that is the end of my organized presentation. And I will go out of the screen sharing. Okay. And let uh, Dean and Henry take back over. Yeah. Well, I'll start out with a couple of questions for both of you. Um, and here again, I want to encourage you, you can always use the excuse of the full answers in the book. So everyone should uh, support their local journalist and their local bookstore. Absolutely. Auto Books in Burbank is the place you can buy autographed copies from these two gentlemen, or you can go online and find it at other sources. But uh, we recommend Auto Books. Uh, what were the biggest surprises? You know, because both of you, we're in essence documenting history that you lived through. So were there some major surprises like you had no idea what was going on at the time? Well, I think, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, for me, it, and I think you, you made an important, important point there. Um, I did live it. Yeah. Um, if you consider that, you know, for all practical purposes, the the two the, the 96 split started in 78, 79 when when cart broke away. I lived through the 80s as a fan and then a super fan that started traveling to Nazareth and Toronto and even Long Beach. Um, and then as, as a journalist, you know, I, the moment that I got involved as a journalist in 93, it was arguably at its, at its peak. It's the year that Nigel Mansell ran and it brought unprecedented world interest to IndyCar racing. And it's, it just seems unfathomable that Tony George and the Speedway almost resented the success that CART was having with IndyCar racing. So for me, the surprises occurred along the way. Um, and, and they usually occurred in the form of, of off the record conversations, whether it was with Kevin Kalkoven or Mario Andretti or Jerry Forsyth or whoever, um, because of the way I handled the book and in treating it as a historic document and actually reporting the story in real time using historic media reports. And then my own reporting from the nineties onwards, um, you know, the, 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 the Eureka moments in terms of finding things actually occurred in 2006 or whatever. So Mr. Zimmerman, how about you? Any surprises, you know, you learned years later about Formula 5000? Well, I, like I say in the book, as they say, um, it, I, my career didn't happen until after 5000 was long dead and gone. 
but I'd seen races as a fan, as John did. I would go to the, wherever I could get to to see the races. And I saw a handful of 5,000 races and thought it were, they were incredible cars. And, uh, and as I, you know, I progressed through uh, the, the 80s and 90s and the, the noughties, uh, my career developed into editorships here and there at Racer and on track and uh, at Auto Week. And uh, you're immersed in it. And John, John's book is much more a history book than mine. Mine is a story about this thing and talking to people who were in it. And I, 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 it is a history, but it's not a, a chronicle like John's book is, which is really, really what's needed on that particular subject. And so I'm happy that this is out and it seems to be being well received. And uh, thanks to Joe Freeman and Racemaker Press. And, and again, like John says, thanks to you guys for having us on here. I see. Uh, I'm hoping we get start getting some people to type in some questions. I see Jerry LaRue's watching. I see Thomas Crahan, Brian Uchia. If you see some names I know who probably have some good questions, either on the technical side or on the um, uh, organization side. Let me, I'll throw you a Robin Miller type question. If you were given the ability to write the rules for IndyCar 2025 or something, John, what would you like to see? You know, because it has to balance out, you know, affordability to some level. You can't price this out of, you know, even an OE level participation. So what would you like to see to bring back more innovation? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum because I think up the, if you look at it up through the early seventies, the cars just got faster and faster, whether it was turbos, whether it was slick tires, whether it was aerodynamics. I mean, in the early seventies, the pole speed at Indy jumped 17 miles an hour in one year. And then they had a bad month, May in 73 and a couple guys got killed. Um, and so the focus became on, instead of speeding the cars up, it, it, it began slowing them down uh, in the name of safety. And then and this is kind of the NASCARization that's occurred in almost every form of motorsport. The focus now is to make sure that every car is the same, that nobody can gain an advantage. Uh, whether you're Dale Coyne racing or Penske racing, you're not allowed to develop your own front. You're not allowed to build your own car. You're not allowed to develop your own front wing or your own suspension components or whatever. So I think you have to accept that, that spec racing as a start is here to stay, or at least semi-spec racing. We should be grateful that we at least have multiple engine manufacturers in IndyCar now. And, and for all their wishful thinking about getting a third one, I mean, good luck. Um, I don't think that's going to move the, the needle commercially. But I think if we can keep some sort of formula where there is at least free engine competition, I would like to personally see more power less reliance on, on aerodynamics. Um, you know, one way to get faster cars. Um, I think, I think the fastest way is to simply through the tires and certainly one way to increase speeds and competition is to open up the tire manufacturer competition. Um, I think Firestone has done an outstanding job and they're, they're wonderful in the sense that tires are rarely a story in IndyCar racing the way they are in a negative way in NASCAR and Formula One. But at the same time, their product is so consistent and so reliable that, that if you think about the notion of a, another manufacturer coming in there, just kind of push the development war, um, you know, I, I think it's... I think it's certainly easier to find a second a lap in tires than it is in, in another 150 horsepower or fancy aerodynamics. So um, they're, they're in a tough, you, you know, you'd love to see as much freedom as possible, but I think we have to accept that it's a semi-spec era. I thought that they, they actually, when they had the aero kits, that was a really good idea that was badly executed. And the interesting thing is that IMSA is using that concept to great success right now with their Daytona prototype internationals and their future uh, LMDH cars in which they're, they're taking a an homologated central tub, whether it's from Delara or Areca or whoever, and they're allowing manufacturers, whether it's Mazda or Cadillac or Acura or whoever to put their own body work on it. And that's kind of like a, probably the best we can hope for in terms of cars looking different. Thank you. A uh, question from Jerry LaRue for Mr. Zimmerman. One of the stories about Formula 5000, the Lola T332 
helped kill off the series because it became the dominant chassis. Do you think that was a correct assessment or just a minor part of the demise? Well, it certainly did that. Um, it came in, and that's, that's what I was going to say. When John's talking about the engine formula, the thing with 5000 was the engines were free, except they had to be stock, stock blocks and stock heads. You could, you know, they have experimented with flat plane cranks and things like that. And eventually, there were a, 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 probably a dozen real constructors at one point or another built cars for this series, but it, it got down to Lola, hit the magic button with the 330, 332, 300, 330, 332, and everybody who wanted to win had to have a Lola. I mean, there were eagles, there were shadows that came in and tried to fight the, uh, fight the tide, but they couldn't do it. The, the Lola was just too well established with all the superior teams and Haas and Hall. And the Haas Hall team was essentially the Lola factory team, and that's Redmond's team that swept the last three championships. So if, if it, was, it was, may have killed it off, but everybody was still able to get that car, it wasn't that you couldn't get it like the 91730 or the Eagle Mark III in, in GTP. So it was, it was, uh, there was more to it than the Lola was the problem. But uh, follow on that, since Formula 5000 was not a U.S. specific series, they ran Formula 5000 in Australia, New Zealand, as well as Europe. What did that contribute in? What was the impact of that? Well, it was, in, it was invented here. John, K, John Bishop and Jim Kayser at SECA created Formula 5000. It was then adopted everybody oh the john webb in england and various people in europe and as you say australia and new zealand said oh look at this idea and let's do that but um you know they they came up with a, a formula for a stock engine that you could build a car around and that was a the thing they, you didn't have to buy a specific car you could build your own well in the end it turned out that lola built a better car and everybody went well we, if we want to win we have to have one here's an interesting current sidelight is that formula 5000 is making a comeback of sorts in australia there's actually a current new formula 5000 series and the cars actually look a lot like formula 5000 cars they have a tall air box and everything i'm not well versed on it but i know that the the v8 supercar racing as it was known is very popular down there so it seems like a logical outlet for for those engines they have recognized there's a good thing no Actually, uh, the cars look neat. Uh, question uh, about what was behind the scenes between the later half of the 1980 USAC season's transition to the cart calendar? I know that's in the book, but do you want to give a shorthand answer to that? John? And also who was involved? Yeah, the short answer is, is that um, between 19, the 79 season and the 1980 season, when cart and USAC both ran full series of races in 1979. John Cooper was the president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And John Cooper's a kind of a mysterious cloak and dagger guy in the history of all this. His history goes back to the formation of USAC in the 50s. And he's worked for the Speedway. He's worked for NASCAR. He's I tried to talk to him several times over the years and never, never could get him to talk. I always knew he'd be an important person but he never would budge on talking. Anyway, Cooper's the guy that kind of orchestrated a, a peace treaty in the spring of 1980. They had a summit in Hot Springs, Arkansas, I want to say. And so they, they kind of put together an amalgamation of the CART calendar and the USAC calendar. And they ran at, um, I think they ran in Ontario and a couple other races before Indy. And they got to uh, Pocono and, and the proverbial shit hit the fan again. And, and it was Cooper again. I mean, Cooper was the guy that brought it all together. And then all of a sudden, Cooper announced that he was shopping the sanction of the Indy 500 because he no longer believed that USAC was a independent sanctioning body. And it was it was intended to just I don't know. It was it was ultimately it was a shot at cart. And they, you know, they made a dog and pony show of shopping the, the sanction around to the NHRA even. Um, but ultimately, they put USAC back in charge of the Indy 500. And the gist of it is, is that CART picked up the rest of the schedule for 1980, starting with Mid-Ohio. And CART ran the series after that. But USAC made control of the Indy 500. So from 1981 to 1995, um, it actually technically it started in 82, USAC 
tried to run a, an 81 series that uh, that's where uh, Foyt famously won his last race, the 81 Pocono 500. Uh, he was in a, a modern March Cosworth and seven or eight cars in the field were front engine dirt cars. I mean, it was just embarrassing how far USAC had fallen in terms of sanctioning an entire series of races. But yeah, Cooper, Cooper's the guy that brought it together and Cooper's the guy that broke it up two months later. So it's, it's one of those things that's hard to explain, but ultimately it was to pacify USAC. Awesome. So we have a, another question here. Um, I believe it's from Brian. John, I've ordered your book, but don't have it yet. At the risk of asking about something you cover well in your book, can you tell us a little about the Novi engine and how it did, didn't impact USAC Indy racing? Well, I, I cannot say that's in the book because um, <laughs> uh, we need Robin Miller here to answer that question because Robin was the, the Novi enthusiast. And um, I think it was a curious highlight in the 50s and early 60s. And from everything that I've read, I'm a little too young for it. I've My first year at the Speedway was 1977 and my first race was 78. So for me, the neatest thing was hearing how cool the Cosworth sounded compared to the Offenhauser, which I thought sounded like a tractor. Um, the Novi was loud and it was powerful, but ultimately it was not successful, but the legend endures enough said, I guess. <laughs> I got to read awesome. this question from John Tholley. <laughs> Or if it seems to be biting his tongue a bit, surely he uncovered an ugly story or two about Tony George and the IRL. You're among friends. Let her rip, John says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there's these tricky little words off the record. <laughs> and he did the key to the business. Even though some of these people are dead or I'm dead to them, I need to honor some, uh, some of these confidentialities. <laughs> The best ones came from Mario Andretti, though. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, question about the bookstores, Auto Books and Burbank. And then actually, uh, uh, both uh, Mr. Zimmerman, what's the direct uh, connection for ordering your book online? We'll, we'll post these web addresses to our Facebook page afterwards. But Yeah, racemaker.com is Racemaker Press. It's in Boston. So and Oreo, direct order of your book? Octanepress.com. Okay, good names for car for uh, car books. Mm -hmm. So we have another one. Um, what recipe would you recommend to bring back a reincarnation of the F five thousand series? Lots of cars, low cost, and lots of noise. Ooh, um, it'd be kind of hard to accomplish these days because uh, there was a lot of independent spirit there in the beginning, and that would be you know the, the constructors would be building the cars. And the guy in the garage wouldn't really have a chance because he doesn't have the same uh, resources, which, you know, there were a lot of home builds, uh, a handful of home builds anyway, running around in the early days before the manufacturer said, oh, this is a good series. Let's build cars for that and took over Lola primarily, but also Eagle built a lot of cars, Surtees, McLaren built cars for it. McLaren won two championships. Eagle won He's going to laugh at this. I'm going to let my, my noisy cat in. <laughs> Anyway, um, so it would, it would be the, the, the Australian series that John spoke of is a nice attempt to recreate it. It's the same basic concept updated. It's, it's like the first time I, I was a mini owner back in the 70s. And when I got in the new mini, the best thing I could say was that it felt like a, a mini would, that would have evolved for 20 years. And that's what this formula, this S, S5000, they call it in Australia, is now. It's the modern take on the old formula is the one in Australia. The new one is that the highest tier of motorsports in Australia right now. I believe so. The only thing would rival would be supercars, and that's fenders. So yeah, certainly, I I would say that the the five thousand cars are faster than the supercars, but the supercars yeah. are the equivalent of NASCAR down there. They are an institution. Yeah, and and one of the, the thing I'd add about the the new iteration of 5,000 in Australia is, is that they have had a history of open wheel racing um, in Australia. There was, of course, the Tasman series in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, but Scott Dixon, for example, they ran something called Formula Holden in the 80s and the 90s. And it was, it was kind of like Indy Lights in the sense that it was a Formula 3000 Indy Lights type chassis with a, with a Holden V6 engine. Uh, Scott Dixon was uh, Clayton, please. 
Um, Scott Dixon was, was the champion in that. And it was his stepping stone to come to America where he did Indy lights and then cart and then ultimately IRL for his career. Uh, I'm going to jump to this one from Thomas Crahan. Given the uh, spec bias of the series in the U S is all technological progress coming from Europe? If so, are the engineers involved in the U S series focusing on setup only? Does that mean the major U S team turn to engineers with European experience to deliver innovations? And that may not necessarily be a fair question for you two guys. Uh, no, they're all they're all constrained by the by the rule book. That's the thing. Yeah. It's just there are fewer and fewer things that you can work on. I mean, in IndyCar racing now, so much focuses on um, shock absorber technology. You know, when you get to the Indy 500s and little things like bodywork fit and things like that. So there are fewer and fewer things you can work on. And the fascinating thing, um, and especially now with NASCAR going to a new generation of cars next year. NASCAR has been, you know, kind of criticized for decades for being this, you know, super low end Neanderthal technology, but starting probably with Ray Evernham and in, in, in that era, the level of engineering that goes into those Neanderthal, you know, the rock crusher Muncie gearbox and Ford nine inch rear end and all that, the, the level of engineering on that got extraordinarily sophisticated and there was definitely some some international and european influence the guy that runs hendrick right now i don't know his name but he's south african for example what percentage do you think of the engineers at an indycar team are u.s born and bred versus uh educated and experienced from europe any idea oh gosh it's i mean it's at least half um, and I have to admit that my, you know, I'm, I'm not as in touch on a day-to-day basis as I was certainly in the nineties, there was a lot of English influence, uh, from the chassis manufacturers from Reynard. Um, you know, you had Malcolm Osler was Australian, uh, you know, some of the engineers that I worked with at PAC West back in the day, Andy Brown, Alan McDonald, uh, were English. Um, so it's, the, the technology came first from Formula One, and I think it's probably natural that some of the engineers came with them. You need to go back outside because you're being annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Hold the cat up, John. Hold the cat okay. up. <laughs> uh, there he is. Let's see the star. There he <laughs> is. This, this is Clay. Clay Regazzoni. Clay Regazzoni. Love it. He's a good boy. You can hear him purring. Ah. Uh-huh. Be quiet, boy. Um, so we got another question here. Um, I hear racing technology works its way down to production cars, and I get the impression that this trickle down was more prevalent in earlier years. Is this true? Well, I think that yeah, after a while, there are, there are only so many problems. And as you solve them, then they go away. And it is, it's more it, it, the engines and gearboxes and bearings and things like that, the mechanical bits, the, the, the designs and the aerodynamics don't really transfer because this is a, a, a pure thoroughbred racing car, I call them. Whereas, you know, you, the mechanical bits would be what would transfer to production cars. Interesting. And then additionally, do you think increased regulations reduces technology trickle down to production cars? Yeah, that's probably true. I think one of the things that racing has been um, really beneficial for is is developing uh, efficient fuel systems uh, because a lot of, come on, Clayton, give me a break. Um, A lot of, uh, a lot of racing these days, certainly sports car and endurance racing, fuel mileage limits. You've got to, you've got to stretch fuel a certain amount. Um, it, this, a lot of this goes back to the development of the, the Porsche tag formula one engine, the Bosch Motronic stuff in the eighties. And one interesting thing these days is that in, in an effort to keep speeds down, you know, because aerodynamics and, and everything are so important, a lot of the race cars that you see on the track are actually less powerful than their street car, uh, com, you know, uh, the, the streetcar versions um you know you look at like a corvette a high-end corvette where they're pushing out 750 horsepower these days and the the car that races in imsa is is limited to less than 500 uh the same deal at the indy 500 you could have a 750 horsepower corvette that's a streetcar that's that's pacing 
600 horsepower Indy cars. And, and, uh, the, 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 the thing you have to say about that is that the reason that you can have 750 horsepower Corvettes or Shelby Mustangs or whatever is, is that that technology was developed in racing originally. Okay. Too cool. Um, another one for you, John, uh, it looks like finally that the car count is edging up and drivers from various series, Europe and NASCAR are coming in. Do you think that this will continue and IndyCar will take back some of the NASCAR's popularity, partic particularly with TV viewers? Well, I mean, that's the, that's the ultimate big question is, is can it, can it commercially, can it attract more sponsorship? Can it attract a bigger television audience and everything? Uh, what you said, it's, you're right. It's really encouraging. The car count is creeping up. I mean, there was, there was a time where it was down to 18 or 20 cars and they're at a point now where they're getting 24, 25 on a regular basis. And sometimes they're getting 27 or 28. Um, it's, it's very encouraging. And I think, I think some of it has to be driven by the fact that IndyCar racing is a Penske production now that Roger Penske has taken over the Indianapolis motor speedway, the IndyCar series as a whole. And Penske uh, adds credibility to any, any arena that he goes into. Um, and so I think that there's, I, there, there's definitely, there's been less with, with Jay Fry in charge, you know, technically and, and commercially, there's been a lot less um, dissension between the competitors. Everything's a lot more harmonious within the paddock. And there's now this there's this sense with with Penske leadership, you know, the, the Holman family, they they carried the ball for 75, 75 years and they did a hell of a good job. And they were smart enough to realize that somebody else could do it better. And they were also smart enough to realize who that person or that company was. And so I think that with with Penske in charge, it, there's credibility and there's confidence in IndyCar racing that hasn't been there for for a long time. And and you know, on top of that, just the the fact that the Holman family was able to step out of it gracefully after everything that's happened over the last thirty whatever years, um, it, it's it's just it, it it's a good happy ending that uh, that the sport's in good hands and that and that the transition occurred gracefully. For uh, Jay Z, uh, going back, to, for me, the, the two most iconic Formula 5000 races were a, both one offs the Questor Grand Prix and the original inaugural Long Beach Grand Prix for Formula 5000. So, even with those two events, and you want any good stories or anything about the uh, Questor Grand Prix? You want to explain what that was? Well, the Questor Grand Prix was a uh, Formula One versus Formula 5000, and all the Formula One cars that came over were top line cars and the 5,000 seemed to be a bunch of, oh, you got a car, bring it. Mark Donahue came in a Penske Lola and was easily the class of the field because uh, it was the most up-to-date car and the rest of them were not, you know, in the same league with that, let alone the Formula One car. So it, it was an interesting uh, experiment, but it didn't, it didn't work because of the disparity of the quality of the cars. It did draw a nice crowd to Ontario. And uh, Long Beach, well, it's still going strong today. So that was a, more of the yeah. venue than, than the cars. But the, they needed to have 5,000 because Pook always wanted to do Formula One. And the 5,000, there was a rule in those days you had to have a qualifying race to make sure your circuit was up to snuff, as it were. And 5,000 was the closest thing you could get to Formula One, which as an aside, Mario says, when we had our Formula One car, we took it to Riverside, and I could never get close to my 5,000 times at Riverside. <laughs> and as you'll see in the data sections in my book, there, there are a handful of tracks. Watkins Glen, the 5,000 cars were quick, quicker, and, and in most port, they were all very close. And it just, it was at the time, it was so state of the art, as it were, even though it had this stock engines, and there were not only just Chevrolets, because Chevrolets got the classic small block, but their Ford Boss engines came in. Falmer won a couple of races with that. Um, the Holden came up from from Australia with uh, Frank Man Frank Manage and Frank Maddock. Frank Maddock, yeah, and and won at Riverside on aggregate because the top cars fell out, but he still won. You got to get to the checkered flag, you know. And then the Shadow in '76, the last year, won a race with a Dodge Power. 
So in the cut, then Gus Hutchinson won a couple of races with Cogsworth because the Formula Formula One, the three liter engines were still allowed. And and someone even Donnie raced with AMC once or twice, right? Yeah, he did. They they brought AMC and they didn't win. Yeah. IMC came in and there were other engines uh, tried as well, but. Uh, Oh, yeah, you got something to add there? Yeah, I'm going to put my hand up. And, and you know, there was a time toward the end of the Formula 5000 era, right before the SCCA ended Formula 5000 and turned it into the so-called new Can-Am with Formula 5000 T30, 332s with bodies. But USAC and, and the SCCA, you know, they co-sanctioned the 5000 series one year in 74 or 75 and there were a couple of races where, like, Bobby Unser ran uh, an Eagle Offy IndyCar. At Riverside. And, and then on top of that, if you want to draw it out, you could say that, that Tony George, when he went to the IRL in 97 with their normally aspirated formula, you know, they, they wanted to create the illusion of stock blocks. And those weren't exactly stock block engines. But the key thing about those engines were they had to use – common bore dimensions or something like that. Anyway, they ended up being the wrong architecture for a, for an engine that spends sustained time at high RPMs. But if you think about it, you know, some of Tony George's thinking in, in going to the so-called stock block, it kind of echoes formula 5,000. Um, and, you know, again, had the execution been better, it, it could have made a comeback in the nineties. Yeah, it was a production engine that he put, you know, production-based engine that was then modified. That does, I mentioned that it does, it, it did echo Final Formula 5000, but uh, not exactly the same. They, they were, those engines were huge. I remember reading when I was a kid in Autosport, Dan Gurney offered a challenge, I think around 1972, Bobby Unzer and the Olsen Eyed Eagle at the Nürburgring against any Formula One car. And I think he was putting up a hundred thousand dollars challenge. No Formula One team accepted the challenge. Yeah. Remember nobody, that, John? No, nobody took it up. Uh, well, I mean, they they all respected Dan Gurney. It's like Dan wouldn't be making that challenge unless he knew right. he could just yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, now, could the, they have uh, made? Could they have made that engine last fourteen miles? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Uncle Bobby, Uncle Bobby. Um, Led eight laps at Riverside in his 5,000 race. That's the race that's on the cover of the book. I thought so, yeah. And his story is in the book about, well, son, you know, as Robin would say, well, son. And he tells, you know, he tells you, he says, well, I, had, I knew Mario was going to do this, so I'm going to do this. And he says, I looked in my mirror and I couldn't even see him. <laughs> We're kind of closing in after an hour. Any uh, Anything else you'd like to mention? You know, what was of doing the book on both of you, what was there one key interview? It sounds like Oreo, you time spent with Mario Andrade was kind of key <laughs> for quotes, even if you can't repeat them uh, in a minute. This, this is, I, I obviously I can't repeat the off the record part, but so um, I've had a long standing relationship with Autosport Magazine of Japan. There's obviously the legendary English Autosport Magazine, but there is a Japanese magazine called Autosport. And in the summer of 2006, 2007, they wanted me to write a story about Marco Andretti. Uh, so I called up Mario and, you know, we're talking about Marco and just unprompted. He just, he's like, ah, I tell you, you know, I got them together and I got them talking. And, you know, he just, he, he goes on about how badly champ car as it was known then and, and the irl had to come together he's like ah, i can't you know i can't reason i'm like a broken record he goes on and on he gives me this golden quote it's like i got him to the altar several times i just can't get him to say i do and <laughs> but the problem was okay and and he had some pretty salty things to say and <laughs> actually my last conversation with Mario at the speedway in May <laughs> ended up in a somewhat similar way. John Folly will be pleased. I'm having a adult beverage here at 10 PM. Uh, maybe I'll loosen up a bit here. Um, but, but the conversation with Mario was clearly veering on and off the record, but I was pretty confident in what was off the record. I mean, I know what was off the record, <laughs> but the words were never said. Anyway, I, I wrote a, 
I wrote a column about it for ESPN.com. You know, it's like Mario says, we need to get together. He's like, I had this meeting and it got blown up, blah, 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 blah. I go to, I go to Watkins Glen that weekend. It's like 4th of July weekend. And a lot of people are like, Hey, Oreo, great story. Robin Miller comes up. Oh man. He calls me. Oh man. Those are the best quotes ever. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And I drive home Monday, 8 30 Tuesday morning. The phone rings. It's Mario. He's like, ah, I can't believe it. You threw me under the bus and Tony's pissed and Cal Coleman's pissed. And, you know, and I'm just mortified. Um, you know, I, Fred nation used to say you're critical, but you're fair. So I don't get calls like that very often. And when it's Mario freaking Andretti, that's <laughs> doing it, you know? So, I mean, I was just mortified. What I did was I sat down and I typed a letter and I, I wrote a letter to, I addressed it to Tony George and Kevin Calco and I copied Mario on it. I sent it off and I never got like a direct response from any of them. But I saw Mario two weeks later at Edmonton and he's having a press conference and I walk in and he's like, Hey, you know, and, and um, he keeps grinning at me throughout the, throughout the press conference. And, and afterwards I go up and I'm like, Hey, are we okay? He's like, Hey, bad boy, we're fine. Don't worry. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I, I doubt that my, my letter had anything to do with it, but, but, and it'd be interesting. I should go back and I don't think I've read it since then. And it's been darn near 15 years. But I just I just poured my heart out. I said, look, guys, this is stupid. You know, this has to stop. You're killing an industry. Yeah. You know, please think about the big picture. And, you know, it's it, it was critical. They were at a very touchy time where we're, you know, they things were getting pretty sensitive. And and a, and a couple months later, it was clear it was clear why because they were close. And then finally, in early two thousand eight, they made it happen. But my God, what a long and excruciating process! I mean, from even before the IRL started in ninety six, you know, there were ninety five peace talks and ninety nine peace talks, and it just ah, it was just it, it was the boy that cried wolf. You know, you just you never wanted to believe that it would ever happen. So I'm so happy that it did for the sport and everybody involved in it and, and for the fans, especially. Jay-Z, uh, a particular favorite quote, we'll give you a lot. One last thing here. Who was the best quote about Formula 5,000 or what was the most memorable interview you did? Well, I, I'm thinking about that. The, the best interview I think I did was with Jim Hall. Cause he was, he was at the top and, and had been at the top before he got into 5,000. And, uh, he provided a lot of insights and things. And, and like John said, the USAC and SECA tried to co-sanction 5,000 and it didn't work. They couldn't get out of each other's way as it were. Yeah. And, um, the thing, the thing is uh, that if I had written the book earlier, I would have been able to talk to a whole variety of different people who have since passed on. Yeah. In fact, I have quotes from like half a dozen people, Tony Adamowicz, Rod Campbell, Repi Wietzes, who have since passed on since I talked to them about this book. So it would have been a different book. I mean, it wouldn't have been a different book, but it would have had more content with those people in it. And uh, it, it's just the, the, as John says, the, the, the key to the business, the key to the motorsport journalism business is the off the record conversation because it teaches you what you, can what you can talk about and what you shouldn't talk about, even though you know it. And the best way to get it around is to phrase your comments so that you verge on the off for the record part while it's staying on the record. And that's the trick. Got a nice uh, shout out from Jerry LaRue. He's bought both books, enjoyed them very much. Kudos to both you guys. Uh, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Actually, one much. last question for uh, Oreo. Uh, a conversation I remember having with Robin Miller years ago I think he's made comment to a bunch of people that he's written the definitive A.J. Foyt biography, but he was waiting for A.J. to pass because he knew that if he published it when A.J. was alive, A.J. would kill him. Um, <laughs> does, does that book actually exist? And now that Robin has sadly passed, will that ever see the light of day? I, I can't imagine that it does. Um, Is this a Robin joke? Okay. You know, Robin, I mean, first of all, the thought that Robin Miller didn't outlive AJ Foyt is staggering. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, AJ Foyt's been trying to kill himself for 60 years. Um, <laughs> AJ's in more <laughs> bulldozer or killer bees or the Ford at Riverside or so. Oh man. Good old Robin. Yeah. What's your question again? I'm sorry. I got... Did Robin actually start to write a book on AJ or not? I don't think he did. And, okay. and, you know, Robin's just, Robin's not the book type. Yeah. And a book about Robin's life would be, unbelievable but i don't think it exists i don't think that if steve shunk or whoever you know goes through robin's laptop that there's going to be this 95 percent completed manuscript that's that's the racing book of a century but robin did have one book and i'll point it out here i've got it on my shelf right behind me this is a book about the aba indiana pacers oh, yes. from the 60s and the 70s and robin got his start as a journalist covering the Pacers, I mean, Robin was 20, 21 years old and they put him on the Pacers beat and he's out there with a bunch of guys that are, you know, legends in Indiana sport, but it was a bunch of colorful guys. I mean, it was almost like the it's topical now with, with the ESPN 30 for 30 on the 86 Mets, the, the, the seventies Pacers were almost like the 86 Mets in the way that they were a bunch of swashbuckling partiers. The coach Bob Slick Leonard was the leader of, of the escapades. And so if you enjoy basketball and you enjoy Robin Miller, here you go. We changed the game uh, by Bob. The Miller. Guys in the orange ball. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is this is like, you know, this is like the cart car should have won out over the IRL car. But, <laughs> but. Henry, any last questions? No, this was an awesome webinar. Thanks for everyone joining. Um, uh, was... We can go back to the screen share. Just a reminder. Thank you, uh, Mr. Oryavis, for staying up late and uh, in, uh, introducing us to your cat. Yeah, I think he has uh, a cat. I'm a cat, I'm a cat <laughs> fan, so that's Same. good. Thank you, John Zimmerman, for dialing in from Long Beach. I hope to <laughs> here again, uh, for those of you who are local in Southern California, hope to see you at Electrify Expo this weekend. Check your email if you're an SAE member. I did really send a note with a discount code. Hope to see you at Long Beach. Look for the SAE student displays. You know, one other last little tidbit of history that so much of IndyCar history is tied to Southern California. All those Dan Gurney Eagles built yeah. in Santa Ana bunch of those offices and roadsters built the roadsters. Up. Absolutely. You know, Los Angeles at one time was the place for an Indy car. So Parnelli's uh, team in Torrance. Parne yeah. The last ever built in America, formula one car, the Parnelli in Torrance, California. Yep. So some amazing stuff. So thank you gentlemen. And please look at the YouTube link, share this for those who missed this. Uh, you know, we try to expand the reach and hopefully there's some fun stories here uh, on a lot of our topics. So, if you'd like to get involved, please send a uh, note to myself, uh, Delbert Boone, Dr. Chris Bachman. You know, the only way this works, we're all volunteers. You know, uh, John and Henry uh, are here late at Mechanica in Oxnard. Uh, we're volunteers. If you'd like to join us, we welcome your participation. So uh, absolutely. Thank you and good night. Thanks again for having us on. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>